everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Sirfari, and I'll, I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me since 2021. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Anne Cotan, Dr. Karina Todeschini, and Dr. Chiara Giraldo. This session will focus on um, rheumatology. The speakers will present their cases and at the end we'll have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box and at the end the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the uh, OCAD website which is ocadmsk.com and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases, consider registering on the OCAD website. A quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized report use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you all for your understanding and without further ado, I will kick off the session. So our first uh, speaker today is Dr. Karina Todeschini. She's a practicing MSK radiologist and medical director at Santa Monica Imaging. She graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Caxias do Sul with a fellowship in MSK diagnostic and interventional radiology at Hospital das Clínicas de São Paulo. She did a mini fellowship at CRU, Lille, France. She actively participates, oops, she actively participates in educational meetings showing didactic and challenging cases for, from her daily routine. Please, Karina, take it away. Thank you, Aline. Thank you for the kind introduction and thanks again for giving me the opportunities. Thanks also to Laura Kunzler, kind and brilliant rheumatologist, and Cecil Bara Kudimori for all the discussions. Can you see my, my, my screen? No, I'm, I can't. I'm sharing. I can. You can? So yes. something on my yeah, computer. So my goal is to show a case that I made the wrong diagnosis and it's related cognitive mistakes, to show a companion case, and the discussion will be done as the cases are shown. Hmm. Uh, the patient is a 61-year-old female who came the first time in 2019, referred by the orthopedist feeling fourth and fifth metatarsal pain. The radiographs were normal, except for the previous bunionectomy. The MRI P1 and P2 weighted images show a neuroma in the third intermetatarsal space and associated bursitis. Also, we could see subcapital metatarsal bursitis, but at the time it was interpreted as overloading changes. There were no synovitis or bone marrow edema. The diagnosis was mortal neuroma and intermetatarsal bursitis. So now it's 2023. The same patient came, comes with persistent metatarsal pain. She refuses to receive the contrast media. X-rays show, in addition to the bunionectomy, a big erosion at third metatarsal head and focal soft tissue swelling next to the bunionectomy and adjacent to fifth metatarsal head. Uh, joint spaces are preserved. Here is the four-year evolution. P1 and P2 weighted images show an intra-articular tissue or effusion that causes the erosion. The lack of contrast media is limiting the analysis. Morton's neuromas is still there. Long axis P1 and P2 show the joint distension at third M MTP. There is a preserved cortical line of subchondral bone at the base of the third phalanx. Mm. 
sagittal P2 image show bone marrow edema and joint distension. Uh, contralateral foot radiograph shows an erosion at lateral fourth metatarsal head and subchondral cyst. At this point, as I personally know the patient, I pick up the phone and call her. She was returning from the beach and she told me she exaggerated in drinks and barbecue. Do you have gout? I asked. She said, no, I don't, but my mother and sister have rheumatoid arthritis, which is probably what I also have. So here are the few lining. There were no subluxations here. Second is bone mineralization. Uh, I personally find it difficult to access just articular osteopenia. These areas that resemble osteopenia, like in here, uh, are in fact normal, related to soft tissue overlap. It's always better to appreciate osteopenia when non-affected joints are available for comparison. Third is bone production, uh, which is characteristically absent in array. In gout, this low erosive process of atopus elevates the cortex, forming the overhanging edge, which we don't see here. But <clears throat> I was not sure at uh, contralateral foot. I will discuss this later. Next is cartilage or joint space narrowing. It's preserved here. Calcifications are associated to topus and not seen in our case. Distribution is random here. Uh, metatarsal tarsal joint is spared. Both uh, rheumatoid arthritis and gout can affect the midfoot. The erosion uh, here is the big, uh, the big deal. It's a big and subarticular erosion with thin sclerotic borders. So I put both here and I will dis discuss also later. And last, here the, the erosion in detail, and last but not least, soft tissue swelling. There are a lump here and above, which is very gouty. So the, uh, does the case deserve a low energy CT? We thought so, but there were no deposits. Low energy CT is highly accurate in the diagnosis of gout. After the exam, the patient went to a rheumatologist. She had normal serum uric acid levels, positive rheumatoid factor, and positive CCP antibodies. CCP and rheumatoid factor have sensitivity around 80%, and CCP are almost 95% specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So the diagnosis is consistent with rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. 19. I was probably looking at a case of early array. The disease is considered very early until 12 week, weeks of evolution and early till six months. Uh, my first mistake, uh, the fact that the patient was referred by the orthopedist confused me. I thought that the finding, uh, that finding was uh, related to overloading changes. This is called framing bias. So the subcapital metatarsal bursitis. What else did I get wrong? We are all prone to cognitive mistakes. It's interesting how we translate image to words in our head. Bunionectomy is the first MTP change, uh, which unconsciously prevented me to rule out first MTP or erosion. There is a four-year evolution of disease without just articular osteopenia, nor joint space narrowing. Subcapsic soft tissue swelling at X-rays. And the overhanging edge of, uh, at contralateral foot and corticated borders at, of the erosion are both questionable findings, right? I, I, I was not sure, but uh, they are in fact confirmation bias because I secretly wanted to be a gout case. And what did I miss? Even without contrast media, we can see the synovial thickening here. 
it is possible to see phenovirus in, a, uh, in acute gouty arthritis, but it wouldn't cause such a big erosion. Also, there is a small aggressive erosion at plantar aspect of the base of the phalanx. The erosions in gout are typically associated with tofu and are seen on, thurs on dorsal surface of joints. I found this risk from the same patient from 2020. We always performed the Norgard view um, or ball catcher view when arthritis are suspected. So in a well-performed Norgard view, we should be able to see the radial aspect uh, of the base of proximal phalanges and the trichetrum and pisiform. Uh, this radiograph is not perfect, but we can see the beautiful uh, small erosion here in their area of pisiform. So gout and RA rarely coexist. There are explanations for a negative feedback between these two conditions. Here, uh, there is a companion case. It's a female, 57 years old, also referred from the orthopedist, who wants to access Alex Valdez. The long axis T1 and T2 shows an erosion with sclerotic borders at first metatarsal head and a small erosion at the base of proximal phalanx. Midfoot are Sorry, midfoot is widely involved. Short axis T1 and T2 shows extension to medial subcutaneous tissue. We performed a dual energy CT, which shows an overhanging edge of cortex in the erosion, but no crystal deposits. Talking to the patient rheumatologist, we discover she is a long time known case of rheumatoid arthritis in use of Embrel and TNF inhibitor. So treated array is a well-known differential diagnosis of gout. Treatment will allow a reparative response to occur, which gives us erosions with sclerotic borders and overhanging edge of cortex. So take home points. Cognitive mistakes are independent of the observer's experience. Real life is not always by the book. Gout is the great mimicker, but not the only one. Always have in mind the differential diagnosis of early rheumatoid arthritis in cases of intermetatarsal and subcaptometatarsal bursitis. Treated RA resembles gout in image. Background clinical history is essential. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, it's my turn to introduce um, Kiara. Um, she is a um, she took her medical degree and completed her specialty in radiology training at the University of Padova. During her residency, she was a visiting scholar at the University of California, San Diego, under the supervision of Dr. Donald Resnick, and afterwards did an observership at the MSK uh, radiology unit of the Department of Biomedical Imaging and Image Guided Therapy at the Medical University of Vienna. After the uh, residency, she completed a PhD in medical physics at the Center of Excellence for MR Research at the Medical University of Vienna and a thesis on the application of diffuser ten tensor imaging on muscles at three and seven Tesla. During her projects, uh, during her time in Vienna, she also had a chance to collaborate on several PET MR projects and is currently working on hybrid imaging, PET CT and PET MR. She is assistant professor of radiology at the University of Padova and since 2021, the chair of the arthritis subcommittee of the ESSR. Her main research focus is musculoskeletal imaging and has authored and co-authored more than 100 articles published on national and international peer reviewed journals and several book chapters. Okay, Kiara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. It's just a 
real pleasure and honor to be here uh, today with you. Uh, do you see my screen? Is everything fine? Everything's yes. good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I will just present a kind of a straightforward case and recall some uh, diagnostic uh, concept that we probably all well know, but sometimes a, just a short refresh it can be useful. So I present a case of a young female runner with hand and uh, foot pain. In particular, uh, she was a she is, I mean, she was a 23 years old woman when she came to our rheumatologist. She was a usual runner and also martial arts player. She referred that in the last five months, she had an increase in morning pain and stiffness of the right hand and right foot pain, uh, but that especially in the evening. Uh, she referred just an allergy to gadolinium and then we will see how much that will affect our images uh, for later. And But she didn't have any comorbidities and no familiar history for any rheumatic disease. Uh, uh, when she was assessed, assessed by a clinical point of view by a rheumatologist, uh, she, uh, the rheumatologist didn't identify any specific area of pain in the hands, while on the right foot, uh, the pain was especially the second and fourth metatarsophalangeal joint, especially on the left side, so actually were not where she was referring the pain. So a rheumatologist decided to uh, prescribe x-ray. Uh, no, first of all, she prescribed a laboratory examination and we immediately identified increased uh, levels of ACPA and uh, increased uh, rheumatoid factor. No inflammatory indexes were positive and the blood count was overall in the ranges and no other uh, antibodies. After this, of course, as expected, um, radiographs were uh, prescribed. Uh, we can see both ends, the right and the left, and overall they were considered uh, unremarkable and also no, uh, so uh, considering the positive rheumatoid factor and the ACPA positivity, we could have expected erosions or uh, even indirect signs like uh, soft tissue swelling, which were not uh, uh, seen. Uh, I didn't put all the views, but I can guarantee that they were all uh, negative. So also in the head ball view, no uh, particular signs. Uh, we then, um, the patient underwent also uh, x-ray of the feet. Uh, you can see also in this case, no particular changes, no particular pathological signs. Our rheumatologist didn't stop here because the clinical symptoms were actually um, very significant uh, how they didn't, considering how the patient reported them. So prescribed an MR. And um, the patient underwent an MR of uh, one hand and uh, both feet. As you can see, the MR is immediately positive. So we have bone marrow edema of the second and third uh, metatar meta metacarpal bones and of the proximal um, phalanx of the, um, of the second uh, finger. You can, if you look on the axial images um, that we can debate also a bit uh, later on, we see what could be defined either a joint effusion or a, a synovial thickening. If you look uh, carefully on another slide, probably you could even uh, be distinguished between the two. So we have a bit of joint effusion and also the synovial uh, thickening, which more a front um, feature. Then the the feet were scanned, in this case, both feet, and we can see that there was a bursitis between the third and the, uh, the fourth uh, metatarsal bones and nicely seen on, on the axial view. Again, we have uh, joint effusion, uh, but also probably a bit of synovial thickening, which is even better detected on the left side. So we have symmetric findings in the, in, in the feet. We have similar findings uh, between the, hand and, uh, the hands and the, and the feet. So the diagnosis was, as I said at the beginning, it was a kind of a straightforward one. The patient was defined as with uh, early rheumatoid arthritis, uh, immediately started the treatment with methotrexate and folic acid with an increase in dose of methotrexate along the weeks. Um, then our patient came back to our attention after six months of rheumatologist prescribing an MR. And as you can see, again, no contrast medium injection because the patient reported a, a, actually a severe re allergic reaction to that when she underwent an MR of the brain as she was younger. So uh, no more ben bone marrow edema in her hand, no more uh, synovial thickening or joint effusion. And if we uh, compare, especially we can, if, if we can see the previous images, the changes is very significant. If you look at the, the feed, we had the, in this case, only the uh, the left foot was scanned. If we look carefully, again, we had a 
almost a complete resolution of the, sim of the signs of the disease, except for still a bit of bursitis between the third and the fourth uh, metatarsal head, but certainly without very positive response compared to the uh, previous imaging. So in this case, I, uh, it, as I said, it's a direct diagnosis. It was pretty easy to uh, to be seen, but I think that we, uh, the, the type of messages I would like to a message I would like to deliver today is the the fact that we are dealing more and more with cases of early rheumatoid arthritis. We know that rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic autoimmune disease with the uh, inflammatory arthritis with a female predilection. We know that we have. Uh, various uh, factors which can predispose to the onset of this type of disease, starting from genetic factors to environmental ones. And uh, we have uh, then you know, singular triggers which can uh, in um, which, which can onset the, uh, the disease. I don't want to get into details of all the um, pathological mechanisms that are behind the rheumatoid arthritis because also because we are all I think uh, radiologists. So uh, let's focus on what then we can see as a result. But. Uh, as I always say to my residents, we have to understand what happens before to then interpret correctly what occurs in our uh, images. So we have, uh, um, as I said, different triggers, a genetic predisposition, and then also environmental triggers like the smoke of tobacco or the exposure to dust. And then uh, we have the activation of the macrophage and then T and B cells. And in this case, the main target, and that is what we have to remember is the synovium. Uh, we have then synovial thickening and what, what happens on the areas of, of the bone, uh, the bare um, areas not covered by the cartilage, we can then have erosions and infiltration as time passes by and disease progresses with the in, uh, infiltration of the synovium inside. So that is what we can see when we have uh, advanced uh, cases. Uh, we know that the, um, there are classification criteria we have to rely on, which uh, when we have a score that is above six, then we can define rheumatoid arthritis. We also know that in the classification criteria, we cannot really rely on images, but the Euler and um, the American College of Rheumatology highlighted, especially in the last five, six years, that uh, imaging and not only uh, radiograph, but especially ultrasound and MR are essential to perform an early diagnosis and to support the clinical suspect of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So what is early rheumatoid arthritis? It was already said uh, before by uh, our colleagues um, that the, we define right now what is an early rheumatoid arthritis, what is a disease with an onset uh, in the with clinical symptoms which started uh, six months before uh, the patient came to our attention. Uh, actually, mm, the problems that in the past we defined what was early, what the, when the disease was less than five years lasting. And then we understood that we had to shorten our times and then we had the phase of the 24 months. And as I said, right now, our interval is just six months. And that shows how much the, the and what is in, how much is important that we come uh, in a very early phase of the development of the disease. Actually, recently it was uh, it was proposed the definition of the VERA, so very early rheumatoid arthritis, which should be defined when we have symptoms since less than twelve weeks, which means three months. And that is because it has been demonstrated that as early as we act against the uh, let's say against the disease, uh, better is the prognosis of our patient in terms of remission and. Um, indeed, uh, we know that if we can come in the early phase, in, which is mainly characterized usually by uh, synovitis, synovitis and uh, joint effusion or um, mild erosion, so then we can really prevent uh, what all the deformities that we've seen for many years. Uh, what is the role of imaging in the early phase of rheumatoid arthritis? Well, X-ray plays a, play mar a marginal role. We can detect uh, indirect signs if we are lucky, so some soft tissue swelling. Uh, usually, we don't see uh, erosions unless they, uh, the patient uh, have a very uh, severe and active disease, and we don't see the typical symmetric and concentric narrow joint space. Um, what is very useful can be ultrasound, so we can detect synovitis, tinosinovitis, which can be the early signs, bursitis, and we can uh, use, take advantage of the Doppler for, uh, to assess the increased vascularity. Again, if there are radio erosion, so of course they can also be nicely seen with uh, ultrasound. 
MR. MR is essential to see the bone marrow edema. It has been demonstrated that bone marrow edema can be a precursor of erosion. So we have to really pay attention uh, to this finding and uh, do not underestimate it. All the other signs that can be detected in MR can be also easily seen with the ultrasound, as I said before. So MR imaging. Uh, we know that um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is usually a bilateral involvement and hands are commonly involved in the early stages. Uh, if you can uh, perform a bilateral imaging, of course, if it's, there is a time constraint or a co collaboration of our patient, a compliance, then choose one hand, choose the one that is more painful or is the dominant. Uh, as I said before, synovitis can be one of the earliest signs that we can detect. Uh, so we can see the um, involvement of the tendon sheets or of the borosa. Subcontrol edema can be a precursor of erosions. Your protocol can be very easy. So steer into one sequences as recommended in, it, uh, in the paper that was published by, uh, some years ago by the RS subcommittee and post contrast imaging. That is what we've missed in our patient. And uh, sometimes our rheumatologists say, okay, if you, we don't have contrast, we cannot really reach a diagnosis. Um, contrast helps, we can see um, even the, the uh, smallest synovial thickening taking contrast enhancement. But as some author recently suggested, we should probably wonder if you really need that uh, to distinguish between uh, the, the fusion or the uh, synovial uh, involvement. Also, because we all know that uh, the deposit of a gadolinium could be, represent uh, um, a major uh, problem as time passed by, especially for patients who have to undergo uh, several MR examination. Um, just a short recall to the treatment, our patient was lucky, so she could stop immediately, stop not the treatment, but stop at the first state, step at the first phase of what is the recommendation. So uh, methotrexate had a very uh, good effect. So uh, now our rheumatologist is thinking about a dose reduction uh, to see if the remission is standing on. So if there is no need um, to, there was no need to move to any other type of uh, biological uh, drugs or JAK inhibitor that we know are very uh, effective, but they have also several uh, side effects. Um, the response to treatment in patients with uh, early rheumatoid arthritis has been demonstrated to represent a very good prognostic uh, factor, prognostic element. Uh, actually, this author recently suggested to uh, reduce the time of the scan, so uh, shorten your interval before, uh, after a treatment. And because uh, uh, examining your patient after one or, or uh, three months, you can really predict what will be the course of uh, your patient. Just uh, recalling briefly, uh, not for diagnostic use, but if you perform clinical trials. And as I said last week at the ESSR, uh, this is what we have to keep to know and to keep in our mind for our clinical practice, not because we have to apply all these uh, exhausting scores, uh, but just because if we know where we have to look at for a score, that is what we have to put our eyes when we report our uh, in our daily practice. So this is a very complicated primary scores. Uh, thanks God. Um, very uh, a much easier score has been proposed so the simplified versions has been performed perform later on and it's quite easy uh, and a much uh, much better in terms of uh, timing Last but not least, uh, remember that rheumatoid arthritis is a, a systemic disease so this is one of our patients with pulmonary involvement, and you can have cardiac involvement, you can, they can be predisposed to malignancies. So uh, do not uh, forget all these, uh, these aspects. To conclude, so remember that the early or very early diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is essential to start an early treatment and reduce the disease progression. Um, you can uh, perform radiographs. I, I love radiographs and they can provide you a lot of information, but do not stop there if you believe that your patient could benefit of ultrasound and MRI. And if you really believe that the clinical symptoms and the clinical pattern can correspond to the one of an early disease. Uh, remember that bone marrow edema, even if a specific, could be a uh, um, very important sign because it could predict the uh, onset of erosions and uh, synovitis is the earliest finding. So get used to look for that, even if you don't have contrast and any images. Remember that there are the diagnostic criteria. Uh, remember all therapeutic indications because they can have an effect. You can also in your report suggest when this patient could be examined to be uh, to provide uh, the best um, therapeutic option. And also remember the radiological scores, although they are uh, quite challenging in terms of uh, time consuming. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you and I would be very happy to answer to all your questions.
Thank you very much, Chiara. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne Coteng. She's a professor of radiology and head of the MSK radiology department at Lille University Hospital, France. She was president of the French speaking society of MSK radiology, as well as of the European Society of Radiology, ESSR. And she's the current treasurer of the International Skeletal Society. She has authored and co-authored more than 250 articles written six books and given more than, than 300 lectures. Please, and take it away. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the very kind invitation. So let's start with uh, the first case. If I... You can see this 24-year-old uh, man he had a history of pain two months before with a painful wrist, and he had a history of trauma several years before. So he had the radiographs and CT performed elsewhere, um, which were read as a normal, no fracture. So he was referred to our department with a clinical suspicion of occult fracture. And on these coronal T1 and T2 weighted images, you can see a bone marrow edema involving the hemate. And this is confirmed on these axial images. You can see the bone marrow edema of the hemate and of the hamulus. And you can see the enhancement after gadolinium administration. So uh, this may uh, represent a fracture, but uh, in fact, you know that it's quite unusual uh, to have a fracture um, of the hamulus, particularly uh, near the base of uh, this uh, bone. And uh, in fact, on the adjacent uh, sections, you can see a more rounded appearance of this uh, lesion, which is uh, surrounded by a a hypointense sclerotic rim. And in fact, on the initial CT scan, a small osteoid osteoma could be depicted and um, this osteoid osteoma was indeed responsible for the pain uh, of the patient. So as you know, um, in uh, young uh, people, the main uh, etiologies of uh, bone marrow edema of a carpal bone include uh, fractures. And you have an example of a fracture of the trichotrome, and of course, osteoid osteoma. Several weeks later, uh, this uh, patient was uh, referred to our department uh, because he had the vague pain for one year with a, a recent increase, uh, no history of uh, trauma. And on these images, you can see bone marrow edema of the uh, hemate. This is again confirmed on the axial section. You can see the high signal intensity of the hamate and of the hamulus, enhancement after gadolinium administration, and a predominance of the low signal intensity at the hamulus on the T1 weighted images. So, of course, we looked for uh, an osteoid osteoma that uh, we couldn't find, but uh, in fact, uh, three uh, features um, caught uh, drawn uh, our attention. First, the presence of uh, extensive inflammatory changes of the adjacent of tissues. Second, the involvement of the transverse carpal ligament at its attachment site, as you can see here. And third, the presence of irregularities of the outlines of the hamulus. So we decided to perform a CT scan, which confirmed the presence of hyperostosis of this uh, hamulus. And in fact, this association, um, osteitis, antithitis, and hyperostosis is highly suggestive of uh, psoriatic arthritis which is, uh, again, uh, one of the main etiologies of a bone marrow edema involving a carpal bone, and particularly in young patients. Retrospectively, uh, the radiographs were not all that normal. And if you look at the hamulus, 
you can see that uh, on the right side, um, this hymulus has irregular outlines in comparison with the left side. But of course, it's always uh, easy to say uh, uh, afterwards. So during um, the rest of my lecture, I will focus on uh, several MR features, which may be uh, useful for the depiction of um, psoriatic arthritis at the wrist uh, and at the hand. So at the wrist, uh, of course, the distribution, and you know that um, uh, a unilateral or an asymmetrical involvement of the wrist is more frequently seen um, in uh, psoriasis and in, uh, rheumato in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, as uh, synovitis and tenosynovitis are not specific MR features, so the distribution is interesting. But uh, much more interesting is the presence of uh, osteitis and antithitis, such as in our case. But this is another case, another patient, and you can see inflammatory uh, changes involving the, uh, the attachment site of the transverse uh, carpal uh, ligament. And this is another example. You can see uh, inflammatory uh, changes at uh, the attachment site of the flexor carpi ulnaris uh, tendon. Uh, two particular uh, features associated with osteitis and antithitis are also interesting to depict when uh, present. First, hyperostosis, such as in our previous case. This is really very suggestive of uh, psoriatic arthritis. This is another example. You can see uh, osteitis, you can see erosive changes, but you can see also hyperostosis at uh, the antezal uh, attachments. And you know that this area uh, is an area where the extensor capi ulnar tendon and uh, the capsular ligamentous structures uh, attach uh, onto the bone. So this is highly suggestive of the psoriatic arthritis. And in fact, if we look back at uh, our case, you can see the edematous changes of the hemate, but uh, there was also an involvement of the capsular ligamentous structures, uh, which means that uh, an antithitis was also uh, present. And if we look at the radiographs, you can see the uh, irregular outlines of uh, the bones, but once again, it's always uh, easier to say uh, afterwards. Look uh, at this uh, other case. You can see edematous uh, changes of the lunatum and of the trigotrum, but you can see that um, the bone marrow edema predominates at the attachment site of the uh, luno trigotral ligament, as well as uh, at the capsular ligamentous attachment and to the trigotrum. But if you look at the axial images and this T1-weighted image, you can see the irregular outlines of this bone related to hyperostosis. Look at this case I showed you before with the antithitis of the flexor capi ulnaris tendon. If you look at the coronal T1-weighted image, you may see the undulated appearance of the pies form. And on this uh, sagittal T1 weighted uh, image, you may see a uh, hyperostosis involving the distal radius and uh, the lunatum. But of course, uh, uh, radiographs may also be um, helpful, but uh, frequently we do not have the radiographs when we have to um, report the MR imaging. As um, another uh, striking feature of uh, thoracic arthritis when uh, present is uh, the presence of extensive osteitis. So you can recognize uh, this case I showed you before, but you may see in the same patient this extensive uh, osteitis of the first metacarpal bone. Such uh, inflammatory uh, changes cannot be explained by this adjacent uh, uh, synovitis and maybe a uh, joint space uh, narrowing. It is too uh, extensive. This is highly suggestive of thoracic uh, arthritis. Look at this other case. There is a joint space narrowing, but uh, 
Uh, this cannot explain such extensive inflammatory changes of the distal radius and of the carpal bones, um, including the trichotrome, which is not involved in the this uh, joint space uh, narrowing. This is also highly suggestive of thoracic uh, arthritis. Uh, if uh, we look uh, at the digits, uh, once again, uh, the distribution is important. You have uh, more frequently a unilateral or asymmetrical involvement of the digits in the thoracic arthritis. But as you know, uh, involvement of an entire digit, that is uh, MCP, TIP, and DIP joints, or of the MCP and DIP joints, uh, such an involvement is highly uh, suggestive of uh, thoracic arthritis, as uh, rheumatoid arthritis involves the MCP and PIP joints, osteoarthritis, the PIP and DIP joints, and CPPD, the MCP uh, joints. But of course, it's very interesting to depict antithesitis, such as the capsular ligamentous um, thickening in this patient and uh, with an increase in intensity. Or uh, you can see also this antithesitis uh, on this uh, sagittal section. And uh, do not forget to look at the pulleys, we are, which uh, are also antithesis and which may be involved uh, in a thoracic uh, arthritis. Osteitis, of course, if you depict these inflammatory uh, uh, phalanges, uh, intermediate and distal phalanges, are, uh, show the high signal intensity on these situated images. Look at this inflammatory uh, phalanx, highly suggestive of uh, thoracic arthritis. Look at these extensive changes, highly suggestive. And you can see this um, osteitis involving these two phalanges, highly suggestive of uh, thoracic arthritis. Sometimes periostitis may also be uh, depicted on MR imaging in association uh, or not with uh, adjacent inflammatory uh, changes of the bone. This is uh, much more frequently uh, depicted um, in a thoracic arthritis than in a rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Dactylitis, of course, which is, is a circumferential uh, signing uh, of the soft tissue surrounding uh, the bones, as you can see here, but uh, it's usually uh, easy to depict on the clinical examination. This may be seen in isolation or in association with other features such as um, synovitis, antithesitis, uh, or osteitis. And finally, uh, do not forget to look at the nails. For example, in this patient, you can see obvious inflammatory changes of the distal and intermediate uh, phalanges with um, involvement of uh, the adjacent of tissues and probably uh, involvement of the capsular ligamentous uh, structures. So the diagnosis is already obvious uh, for uh, thoracic arthritis. But if you look at the nails, you can see the increased signal intensity of the nails of the same digit in comparison, for example, with this adjacent nail. So this is not helpful in this case, but look at this other case, a 36-year-old woman with no known skin uh, psoriasis, you can see a mild bone marrow edema of uh, this uh, distal uh, phalanx, with uh, some uh, involvement of the adjacent of tissues. You may also see probably an involvement of this um, capsular ligamentous uh, structure. But if you look, um, if you go uh, on the axial sections, you can see the increased uh, signal intensity uh, of the same uh, uh, digit, of the nail of the same uh, digit in comparison with the signal intensity of the adjacent uh, digit. But uh, interestingly, if you look uh, at the fourth and fifth digit, you can see an increased signal intensity uh, of uh, the nail. And interestingly, uh, this woman uh, consulted a dermatologist um, who uh, confirmed the presence of um, thoracic conicopathy of the second, fourth, and fifth digits. 
So I'm not saying that uh, it's interesting to perform uh, MRI of the nails, but uh, it's interesting to look at the nails when you perform MR imaging of the uh, digit, because sometimes, particularly when uh, you have a distal involvement with no uh, obvious features, sometimes you may see some uh, differences. So um, in conclusion, um, we have seen uh, several uh, MR uh, features uh, at the hand and at the wrist that may be uh, useful uh, for the depiction of um, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you all for the amazing cases presented today. Um, there is one question from the audience. Uh, Edward Brown is asking if any is anyone doing dual energy CD for CPPD? He wants to know. Not me. Oh, anyone? Okay. Yeah. Next question uh, from Edward Brown to Ancoten: Is ultrasound more sensitive than CT for CPPD? For CPPD. Um... Well, I think that we should perform ultrasound first because uh, uh, it's easy to perform. Um, it's interesting uh, to, in fact, you know where the people uh, have pain, so you can assess uh, the joint who are painful. And uh, you may see, of course, uh, chondrocalcinosis uh, quite uh, easily because uh, it's superficial. Uh, so I would say that, um, I would prefer ultrasound uh, compared to a CT. Mm. Okay. Um, someone is saying, I just want to precise that in psoriasis arthritis, the poly A3 is most commonly affected than A1, but it's not a question. And I think that's all from the audience. I had Hillary some questions. I had some questions that I was chatting with. Uh, with Kiara and uh, Karina about, um, um, I I was curious about the reference that Kiara was talking about uh, not using intravenous contrast to differentiate synovitis from, I guess, yeah. effusion. And I was wondering what pulse sequences were much, you know, were yeah. most of that. I think. Uh, um... Thank you for addressing that. I mean, putting that paper was kind of provocative <laughs> on my side uh, because I, uh, and, and actually was related to the fact that I didn't have the chance with this case to uh, to inject contrast medium. So, I just, <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, well, let's see what the, what the literature also says and if they are unlucky as I was in this case. But um, I, the, the, the authors of that paper kind of um, try to, to avoid the difference between uh, joint effusion and the synovitis. I mean, how we are good in, in differentiating between that. So the, uh, I, I mean, I don't know them personally, so it's nothing bad against them. But, I mean, I uh, wonder what I wonder what uh, Karina and Anne think. I, I, obviously, stir or fat suppressed fluid sensitive sequences will show us fluid, but I, I feel that 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 can blur the distinction between edematous thickened synovium and, and just bland effusion. And I, I've noticed incidentally that in some cases I see the thickened synovium better on T1, but everyone doesn't, you know, routinely do T1 or mm -hmm. if non-fat set proton density would be helpful. I mean, I'd open it up to anybody. Yeah, I completely uh, agree with you, Hilary. Mm -hmm. I agree also. I think hypersignal in T1 helps me a lot to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that when then you have very uh, extensive, uh, severe cases, then you have the, the, also the shape, the front uh, shape that can help you. But in early cases, uh, I mean, if you have the, the, the T1 can help, but at the end of the day, it's it's fluid or uh, synovium without a contrast. It's really it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I had another question for Karina that I was chatting about. Recently, I had a strange case that um, that I shared on the uh, OCAD online forum, and 
I was wondering, it looked to me like it might be gout, but it seemed to be infiltrating the meniscus and I had never seen that. And I don't have access to DECT where I work. And uh, Bruno Vandenberg actually suggested that uh, conventional CT can be helpful. And he said that using the soft tissue kernel, uh, TOFI can have a, a, an attenuation of 150 to 250 Hounsfield units. And, and I was wondering um, if it would be helpful if you didn't have, you know, like obvious uh, tophaceous gout. Um, I, I didn't know if it's helpful at all, if anyone has experience with that. Well, for for the gout uh, CT uh, may be particularly useful because it show it it can show you uh, increase the density um, with a blurred limit. So uh, I think that um, if you you cannot do dual uh, energy, that might be helpful. Okay, good. That's exactly what what he suggested to me. So and, I, I remember back in the old days when I was training and I, I was taught that there were, you know, so many different um, uh, types of presentation of psoriatic arthritis and that um, one form mimicked rheumatoid arthritis. And, and um, I mean, that's, that's the, that's really what you were showing us at first. Do you have any sense why this might be. I mean, it's curious to me that all these conditions are treated with the same DMARDs. <laughs> uh, so, so your question is why uh, two different diseases can I mean, be... do you think they're really different diseases? I guess that's, <laughs> that's what I'm asking. Uh, well, uh... Everything is related to uh, immunity and bi biochemic changes. So, uh, uh, but uh, it's strange that uh, the, the distribution of uh, arthritis uh, and of the lesions is, is com it's completely different in these two disorders. But you're right; it's the same treatment with mild, uh, mild uh, changes, uh, but uh, it's uh, mainly the main treatment. Yes. I don't know if Chiara has a has no, no, no. for you because no. it's a difficult question, but <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. I mean, I think that we are maybe uh, we would be better with the we. I mean, our rheumatologist would be better in the treatment in the future. In terms, of, I think that so far we are just trying to suppress the, the the type of inflammation that is occurring and not yet targeting what is really what is really happening. Uh, so maybe. Uh, we will, but uh, we'll be better in the future. I don't know, but I agree with Anna. By a, um, I mean, in terms of imaging and what happens, uh, they act differently. Uh, but yes, the treatment is the is the, so far is the same. Okay. Any more questions? So thank you all for tuning in today. We'll we'll take a short break in July. And we will resume our activities on August 24 for a session with focus on sports imaging. See you there. Bye-bye.